Hello and welcome everyone uh, to our webinar on IHM maintenance. I'm Raina Werdemann, project manager within Nautilus Log, and I'm glad to um, let you know that we will have two presenters today. One is Henning Garman of GSR Services, and the other one is Liam Fielen of Nautilus Log. They will introduce themselves in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, if you have any question during the presentation, please submit it via, uh, via the chat, the private one or the public one. It's up to you. Um, yeah, just let me know if you have any question or remark, and then we will answer as many questions as possible right after the presentations. So now I will hand over to Henning. Yeah, thank you very much, Raina. So welcome all of you, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Henning Graman, uh, managing owner of GSR Services, and uh, it's a small expert company for ensuring the compliance with Hong Kong Convention and EU ship recycling regulation for the entire maritime industry. Uh, we have won quite a few awards and we try to drive innovative solutions for enhancing uh, health, safety and environmental aspects from cradle to grave of ships. And with that a brief introduction, I would like to hand over to Liam. Great. Thanks, Henning. Uh, also, thanks, Raina, for the introduction as well. Um, yeah, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the IHM Maintenance um, webinar today. Um, really good to be able to have you all on the webinar today and looking forward to be able to talk through um, IHM Maintenance. Um, from my side of things, I'm um, Head of Operations here at Nautilus Log. A little bit about Nautilus Log. We're a software service provider. And we were established back in 2016, with an award-winning innovative startup from Germany and based here in Hamburg. What we do is we focus on digitalization within the shipping industry, within the maritime industry. And what we look to be able to do, I'm sure you're all aware, there's a lot of paperwork, a lot of regulation that's involved in the day-to-day -day tasks within um, the shipping industry. We look to be able to replace that paperwork, bring cost savings and operational efficiency to the industry and to yourselves. Um, our first product, IHM, um, was a, is a great success. We have over 2,000 vessels that have already been contracted um, to IHM Part 1. Um, and as a natural step, step on the back of that, um, we obviously responded to um, the requirement for IHM maintenance and the market demand. Um, so we're looking to be able to bring that to the market to, to you as well. I'm really, really looking forward to being able to um, show you a little bit about the digital solution, how we support that, and obviously answer any questions, as Raina said, um, towards the end of the presentation. But um, without any further ado, I'll hand back to, to Henning, and I look forward to speaking with you all a little bit later on in the presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, Liam. So today's webinar is about achieving efficient IHM maintenance, and we want to give you some indicators on how this can be done or how we try to be as efficient as possible. All this comes with a certain legal background, of course, and we have the Hong Kong Convention, which has not entered into force, even though it's coming from the IMO. And we have the EU Ship Recycling Regulation, which applies to all EU flagged ships, but also to all EU visiting ships, regardless of their flag. So, the key requirement is to have a certified and maintained IHM part one, which means the hazardous materials and structure and equipment of ships on board. And this will be subject to port state control inspections. And approximately two thirds of the global merchant fleet is affected by this EU regulation. When we look into the IHM development and related responsibilities for new builds, the responsibility lies with the shipyard for existing ships. The responsibility is, of course, with the owners. When we talk about IHM maintenance, we are not talking about new builds because that does not apply. It only applies to ships in service, which means the owner is again responsible for the IHM maintenance. So what does IHM maintenance in fact mean. We have quite a lot of paragraphs in the EU and also IMO requirements or legal frameworks. Don't be afraid, I'm not going to read through all of that because we can cut it much shorter. That means we have to track hazardous materials on board. And this is a technical file, the inventory of hazardous materials, the maintained and also initially developed item is a technical file which belongs to the ship. 
It has to have a validity as long as the ship exists and as it is maintained on hand of material declarations from suppliers, the liability or the validity of these material declarations is as long as the product exists on board. So we talk about, in many cases, about a couple of decades uh, or decades where these documents need to be valid and also uh, at hand, more or less, in case questions come up. So the maintenance process itself starts with identifying the relevant purchase order items. That's one of the most crucial aspects because we have a lot of exclusions from the scope. If a relevant purchase order item has been identified, the documents from the suppliers are to be requested. That means the supplier must provide a supplier's declaration of conformity, so-called SDOC, and a material declaration, MD, which is describing the contents of the product. And once these documents are provided, they need to be reviewed. That's a very crucial aspect because the author or the supplier overtakes responsibility for these documents and they don't need to be further verified by the ship or by the ship owner, but they have to be filled in uh, in a proper way. If a hazardous material is contained in a product and that applies only to one to two percent of all relevant order items, it has to be reflected in the hazardous material data in the IHM. So the initial and certified IHM, we should prepare a working copy and this is going to be further maintained on hand of the material declaration information in case an installation is happening on board. Also, a maintenance report should review or should provide all the related details of the order history for this particular ship and when a change has happened. When should these documents be updated? In EU, the port state control inspection is possible at any time. And the IHM is not only subject to initial certification, it is subject to recertification at least every five years. This can be done either by the classification society or by the flex state, depending on how the flex state is managing this. When we have requirements, we only have to talk about in compliances. In compliance means the ship does not have an IHM or it has not been certified or recertified timely enough. Or the IHM itself is not reflecting the materials, especially the hazardous materials on board. This can happen when a sister ship uh, IHM has been copied for another vessel, which uh, is not necessarily correct. Or the IHM is not properly maintained, or there is no procedure for the maintenance. All this all, all these aspects are subject for the port state control inspections. And when we have in compliances, we need to talk about penalties. In Norway and UK, the penalties are up to 200,000 euros and two years imprisonment. In France, it's half of that. Also, like up to 100,000 euros and one year imprisonment applies to suppliers in case they provide wrong information or the information too late. So this is really a serious issue. And on top of that, we uh, have to look into the charter contracts. The cargo owner will not be happy if uh, delivery is delayed due to some problems related to the IHM or the vessel is sold. So then the buyer can go back to the seller in case he finds some discrepancies. And the same applies to the ship recycler as well. So that means the subsequent damages might be even much higher than the direct penalties from authorities. So the question is basically, what are your experiences with regards to the uh, penalties or problems uh, related to IHM and IHM maintenance. So we have prepared a little poll 
where you can vote according to your experiences in this regard. So we have one minute. So, and uh, please make your selection according to your experiences. Uh, for us, it's always uh, interesting to learn about that as well. This poll is especially, of course, with regards to who's taking care of the maintenance, uh, which means we talk about responsibilities for the IHM maintenance and who has to justify any discrepancies. We don't have so many uh, owners or managers as participants at the moment, so I think that we will see only very few votes. Okay, thank you very much. So one is taking care of IHM maintenance in-house, two are using external service supplies, and one has not implemented the IHM maintenance for that. Okay, thank you. So the question which comes basically following this is who can do the IHM maintenance? And we call these guys IHM maintenance specialists. And I will give you the reasoning for that very soon. So what does this person need to know? Of course, the scope of IHM maintenance is one of the crucial aspects. What is included and what is excluded, and that directly relates to all the different legal aspects. Knowing about the exclusions or the relevancy of purchase order items is the key. There are a few exclusions. First of all, we talk about IHM part one, structure and equipment of a ship. And then on top of that, there are quite a few exclusions and the scope has to be understood very, very properly. Otherwise, too many uh, requests will be sent out to the suppliers, which is one of the key problems which we have today. In addition, compliance data exchange principles. This kind of documentation has been implemented in other industries many, many years ago, sometimes even two decades ago. So, and from them, a lot of uh, the different techniques and procedures can be also used and slightly adapted for the maritime in industry as well. So, with this in mind, who can do the IHM maintenance? You might be familiar with the word IHM expert. These are persons from our point of view who are doing the IHM development, the initial development. They need to know ship technology, where hazardous materials might be found, health, safety and environmental aspects and related documentation of the onboard inspections. These persons also need to involve an accredited laboratory and they provide the service usually once. And for these persons, class approvals are very common. Uh, GSR has more than eight approvals for carrying out IHM services as IHM experts. But in contrast to that, the IHM maintenance specialist, he needs to know data exchange principles and the exclusions of the scope of the IHM. That's one of the key aspects. He has to track the orders and relate documents from credit to grave and he is providing this, his services uh, continuously and there are no class approvals available at all. So even though quite a few of these maintenance specialists uh, claim to be class approved, there is no such approval available at all. Having said that, like a general introduction, I would like to hand over to Liam uh, and then you will hear my voice again a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Henning. Um, let me just move on to the next slide. So, um, yeah, again, thanks, Henning, for, for the, the first part of the webinar. Um, from, from my side of things, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, IHM maintenance from a digital perspective. So, first of all, what is behind IHM? And then how can we look to be able to support the process from, as I said, a digital perspective? 
So at a first glance, IHM maintenance is, is really another task, another frustration that's added to the desk of the ship owners and managers. It's more regulation and more effort that's involved. It leads to and involves a significant amount of work and effort from all parties involved. Following on from the IHM part one, this record needs to be maintained with relevant changes recorded and updated. And it's the owner's responsibility to keep the inventory of hazardous material part one up to date. An IHM maintenance procedure needs to be implemented and this needs to include the assignment of a designated person to maintain any record of changes. There's also documentation in the form of MDs, SDOC forms, which are provided by the suppliers, which are then required to be correctly reflected in part one of the IHM updated. What sits behind these requirements is basically a lot of work and a lot of effort. It's a lot of manual work, it involves the implementation of new or improved processes which have to be put in place. And of course, the additional paperwork that sits on top of that, that the regulations can result in. Put simply, it's a lot of paper and a lot of work. However, first of all, let's take a little bit of a step back and talk about IHM maintenance in a bit more detail. Way before you have a maintenance report, there are a number of actions and key considerations that the ship owner and obviously their partners need to think about to ensure that they are compliant and also to avoid the vessels being, de being detained. So from the ship owner's perspective, they have a lot of responsibilities. If you're a ship owner, you have the responsibility for ensuring the accuracy and the completeness of the IHM. You also have the responsibility to nominate a designated person to manage the IHM maintenance process, alongside ensuring that the correct internal procedures and the assigned responsibilities are completely adhered to. You need to ensure that the correct maintenance system is in place and finally, and this is a key point, they have to make the decision of who conducts the IHM maintenance. So is this internally, or if not, which service supplier should be selected? That's a key consideration. When looking at the IHM maintenance process, there are other key factors that need to be considered and fully understood. And these can include, so the identification of which purchase orders need to be reviewed and whether they're relevant or non-relevant, forms and guidance that sit behind this and the documentation and talking about the documentation there's the reviewing of the incoming documents from suppliers so checking if they are complete if they're accurate if they need to be um, redone ensuring that any updates to the ihm maintenance report accurately reflects any relevant changes which are being made on board there's also communication between all of the stakeholders involved so if you think about it this can be from the owner from the crew, hazmat experts, suppliers, certification companies, and port state control. It can be a lot of backwards and forwards in terms of this communication. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, of course, there's that decision on how best to be able to manage the process and where to allocate the resource. So whether it's internally or externally or both, this decision needs to be made to ensure that a fully compliant and up-to-date maintenance report is in place. Suppliers and the communication with suppliers is one of the main time consuming factors of IHM maintenance. From our experience as well, it's often um, the most underestimated, where there's a lot of effort and interaction with suppliers, it's just not fully understood within the IHM maintenance process. There's a requirement to have accurate and complete documentation, so as MDs and SDOCs from the suppliers. Without the complete documentation of SDOCs and MDs, which obviously highlight the existence of non-hazardous materials or not, the entire IHM maintenance process is not compliant. This means there's a lot of work for ship owners who will be required to follow up with their suppliers until this information and documentation has been received and then fully reviewed. So again, more work, and more communication on the ship owner side. It's also worth noting that it's a significant amount of information from the supplier side of things we've already seen that they're being inundated with such requests from ship owners. We look to support, obviously, the ship owners and the ship managers, but also the suppliers. So we look to be able to provide accurate requests of documentation, clear communication, and supplier-specific landing pages for the suppliers to be able to upload and provide that documentation. So for us, from a, from a software solution point of view, Digital support, communication and standardization in this process and in this request of information really is key, both for the ship owners and their suppliers to ensure a manageable workload and obviously a complete IHM maintenance report. 
the IHM maintenance process requires knowledge on the scope of IHM, so data exchange and also clear supplier communication. Only a few maintenance specialists can provide guidance based on their knowledge and experience, ensuring effective communication when dealing with suppliers, owners and crew. With Nautilus Log and our tool, we can work in collaboration with experts so that they can use the digital benefits of the tool to provide ship owners with guidance, help, support, with validation through the integrated knowledge of the tool. Of course, it's also possible for the owner can handle this on their own. Some of the pain points which can be experienced in IHM maintenance are, for example, the bouncing back and forth between stakeholders can occur and communication become difficult. The sheer amount of paperwork involved internally and from dealing with the supplier documentation. Understanding the, the relevance or non-relevance of the purchase order data. Um, simply the time and the effort required to effectively manage the process and the paperwork to really continually keep this maintenance up to date. Given the amount of information and the multiple communication channels, there's also a high potential for mistakes and errors which when done manually can be really, really difficult to be able to uh, rectify. So now I'd like to be able to explain in a little bit more detail about the automation of the IHM maintenance process from our point of view. We look to support the full IHM maintenance documentation and process for all involved stakeholders. And how do we do it? We look to do it with a digital solution. So we're a digital tool that solves the IHM maintenance requirements and can combine the added expertise of the hazmat service suppliers. It's a complete IHM maintenance service that covers all of the pain points. So on the previous slides, I mentioned some of those pain points. So paperwork, accessibility of reports, reducing the cost of additional resource and supplier management, all of which are time consuming and effort driven. Our tool, we provide the digital software solution, which when combined with the expertise and management from selected hazmat expert service suppliers, means that we can ensure a complete IHM maintenance solution. A maintenance report will simply be available with a click, one click of a button, generating the report, including all of the latest MDs and SDOCs in the document, and that's available 24-7, 365. This means that for all stakeholders, all participants, we find the gaps, and we help with guidance to close them for gap-free documentation. So how does it work? Um, well, think about the ship owner just simply taking all of their purchase orders, placing them into the tool, pressing on start, and letting the process commence. We look to be able to make sure that our tool um, can fit to the client's needs, so both from a business IT and pro procurement point of view. What that means is that we can accept all data formats, so email, Excel, we can even communicate directly with purchase order systems via API. The tool then automatically monitors all the data, finds the gaps, enables the supplier management, whilst also automating the report. The tool can be used as a standalone, or for even more efficiency can be combined, as I mentioned before, with the connected expertise of a hazmat service supplier. You can then manage all of your IHM maintenance process, both efficiently and effectively utilizing the tool. So IHM maintenance requires significant input to manage the process if done manually. If you take a step back and think about how much manual work would be involved for just one vessel per, per year. If you think about the amount of purchase order items that you potentially will have and the need for them to be checked and sorted into what is relevant and non-relevant. Once that process has been done, asking for the documentation, requesting documentation from suppliers. So communication and dealing with suppliers and the time that's required to follow up with them when information is missing, inaccurate, and then checking again to check that the documentation is indeed um, correct and valid. The final stage then is thinking about collecting all of that information and creating a document that covers all of the regulatory requirements. All of these together combined takes a significant amount of time per vessel. We, from our experience, anticipate that on average, this will easily amount to over 150 man hours per year in admin just for one vessel. So for an average fleet of 30 vessels, this can equate to more than two full-time employees. Again, with a digital approach, this time and effort can be significantly reduced. So as I've mentioned already, it's a really flexible tool and it can be adapted to the ship owner's business. So that means it can also be used in the office or it can be used on board or both. 
It also means that stakeholders can just start in the preferred way. Clients can receive fully automated documentation with no paperwork or even with no work at all on their side. This helps to avoid costs, additional resource, and uh, more allocation and effort involved. It also means ship owners can save up to 70% of their time using Nautilus Log as a tool, and actually even more, up to 90% when using together with a service supplier. Our tool is easy to use and connecting couldn't even be simpler. We tailor fit our solution to the business needs and we work closely with both the technical and procurement teams to ensure a really simple, easy, efficient transfer of PO data, purchase order data into our tool. As I mentioned, we accept all formats, email, Excel, and we can even communicate directly with purchase order systems. Once that data is feeding into our tool, we'll take care of the IHM maintenance process. Even in the case where you've used a different IHM service supplier, this can still be managed. We can simply integrate the existing IHMs in a simple, quick, easy manner into our tool. And if we detect irrelevant IHM entries, we can make corrections. But there is some more. The tool ensures complete and compliant 24-7, 365 days a year documentation. It ensures that you always have the documentation, including the full history, for the correct stakeholders at hand, whether that's in the office or on board. In addition, together with the service suppliers, we also help you with the supplier management. Guide, guidance with expertise through the whole process, ensuring that all gaps and findings are handled. So as we did a little bit earlier on, um, we'd like to be able to do um, a, a little poll with you all. Um, this time I mentioned in my previous slides about some of the, the pain and the problem that's involved in um, IHM maintenance. So we have a short poll here, which hopefully I will be able to click to start, which um, it would be great if you could have a look at. I'm just starting it now. And we can see where you've maybe experienced some IHM related problems already. So whether that's during the initial certification, during port state control inspection, um, also sale and purchase of the vessels, um, a really nice one here. No, all crystal clear. If that's the case, nice to be able to hear, um, or it's not been considered yet. And um, while that's going on, I will um, then pass across to um, Henning Graman, uh, who will continue with the second part of the webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, Liam. What we've experienced is that uh, the EU inspections uh, with regards to IHM compliance uh, have been very rare so far. So they started uh, in, in slightly higher numbers over the last couple of weeks. So the first half of this year, hardly any port state control has looked into the IHM compliance issue. So during initial certification, it's normal to get some questions, uh, usually not really problems, but that always depends on the individual class, flag, or and the ship in the residing IHM. Um, PSC inspections are quite critical considering the uh, penalties which are possible. Uh, in the first couple of months, there was still the opportunity for port state control officers to say, okay, now you get two months to provide me with a proper IHM. When we talk about sale and purchase in relation to the IHM, we talk about significant risks, that's clear. And that when all is crystal clear or it has not been considered yet, might be good, might be bad. I'm unable to answer that <laughs> straight away. Nevertheless, what is the efficient IHM maintenance? And no doubt it is uh, a new daily task. Our approach, for instance, is that we only uh, involve proper experts which have been properly trained and know all about the bits and pieces which are relevant. Also with Nautilus Log System, which we are using, we have an integrated machine learning tool at hand, which means some processes are becoming more and more convenient. What is of utmost importance is that we act cooperatively to all involved, including suppliers, that it's a transparent system. So when a question occurs, that anyone who has access to the system, including our clients on board and onshore, can have 
full access to all the data collected and evaluated for them. And of course, we overtake responsibility for our services by really carefully selecting the purchase order items. Uh, if we would not, or if we would like to avoid our responsibility, we would keep the exchange with the suppliers uh, in the owner's hands. But uh, this, as this is such an important step, we clearly say, no, this, this is not the right option. If our clients want us to, we act as their designated person for item maintenance. We support anybody uh, related to this topic. We provide some terms and condition clauses as suggestions. So to integrate the required MD and SDOC documentation uh, in case of purchases. Otherwise, it might be tricky to really request documents from suppliers. And we provide the templates for procedures in regards to the ISM code. Uh, we provide manuals and so on and so on. So what is very important is that the documents, the maintained IHM and any related, let's say, summary in form of the IHM maintenance report is available around the clock. An unlimited number of record reports can be generated in the system. It's not limited at all. And it comes at no extra cost and it's all covered in one fee. So either we do the job 100% or we are not doing it, but we are not splitting up the related costs. The maintenance process itself, it starts with a review and categorization of the order items. In case they are not relevant, this decision is saved in the archive, but it appears in the IHM maintenance report, of course. In case of relevant order items, we send out requests automatically by email. And the feedback, including, of course, the documentation from suppliers, is carefully monitored. We send out uh, reminders, for instance, or we start calling suppliers in case they have some problems. And we review each and every document which has been provided by the supplier to us via the tool. And then if we detect any shortcomings, we provide clear guidance and support to the suppliers to amend the documents for making sure that we only process valid documentation further. So once the documents are found to be fully valid, we, of course, collect them. And we separate them again into zero MDs, saying that no hazardous material is contained in the product. That only needs to be uh, saved in the archive. And we have to track the positive MDs where the supplier says, yes, this product contains one of the hazardous materials or two or three, which is hardly the case. Roughly that applies to one to 2% of all uh, relevant order items because this little fraction of all order items requires a follow-up on board, which means once it is installed, the ship has to tell via the system where and how much they have installed it. And based on that, the IHM itself is updated. And of course, again, the IHM maintenance report. And this is available 24-7. The key aspect, I know I repeat myself, but it's really the careful selection of order items. When the requests are sent out, uh, they receive a link to their own landing page. Each and every supplier gets his own landing page with the forms, with guidance documents, and where they can easily manage the documentation which has been requested from them. We provide individual support via this landing page and there's an integrated chat function. And of course, again, the document review. This is not the only approach which you can find uh, as, as a service offer. There are some other approaches um, available as well. First of all, what we very often see also when we work for suppliers that for all purchase order items, requests are sent out by service suppliers. This is absolutely unnecessary and increasing the workload unnecessarily for the suppliers. Others are estimating whether or not a hazardous material is present in a product. And if they say, mm, yes, could be, 
then they send out a request to the supplier. This is a completely wrong approach when we talk about uh, material compliance data exchange. These assumptions have nothing to do with IHM maintenance. And there are others who say, okay, we collect a few documents as far as possible, but the rest is covered by inspection and sampling. This is completely illegal according to the legal requirements. So, and then there's another one where they speak about their web portal, which identifies hazardous materials through artificial intelligence. That might be an individual source of information or some experience, but there is no global database where the uh, identified hazardous materials are collected. So based on this approach, this is definitely not a compliant approach for IHM maintenance. Then what we can see is that quite a few service supplies are claiming to be class approved. We have approached eight IAX classes. Seven of them said, we are not offering any approval for IHM maintenance services. We don't offer that, it's non-existent. And one admitted, yes, one is in the pipeline, but it will take some more time until we really issue this approval letter. So anybody claiming to be class approved for IHM maintenance is making a wrong claim. So we had a rare chance to compare uh, the performance levels. So two different service suppliers, one of them were of course GSR services, one owner, same ship type and the same period. We talk about a period of one and a half years. Well, one ship in this case, which was not the worst performing ship in, in, in this uh, issue, 4,800 order items were ordered for that ship uh, over a duration of one and a half years. The other service supplier requested for nearly 2,900 purchase order items, the documentation from suppliers, especially the material declarations. That equals to roughly 60% of all order items. We have identified 228 order items to be relevant. That's a ratio of only 4.7%. Seeing the outcome of these activities, there were more than 2,600 unnecessary MD requests sent out by one provider. And he collected only 36 material declarations, out of which only four were relevant. We have collected 226 and we still wait for two other ones. And based on this, or on the order item level, you see one has shot out a huge number of requests, but performed very poorly, the compliance level, considering the relevant material declarations collected, is below 2%. And all documents which have been requested, but not been provided by suppliers, are well documented. When the port state control comes on board and checks your IHM compliance, this is black and white. It can't be made easy or easier for the port state control to identify that the maintenance does not work. Luckily, we are close to 100%, which is very good in this case, but uh, it's not uncommon. But we talk about a compliance aspect and just, just recall the uh, penalties. So how can we achieve it? Yes, it's based on experience. We have eight specialists in-house. We started looking into the principles and how the item is to be maintained back in 2007 already. And of course, we don't have any class approvals. So when we go down to the different order items, we have gone through the major catalogs uh, which are used in the maritime industry. We evaluated more than 65,000 different catalog items on their relevancy for item maintenance. We have evaluated more than 1.7 million line items uh, during the service period, and we created more than 2,000 categorization groups. This is only for identifying the relevant purchase order items. The majority of the workload comes with the exchange uh, with the suppliers and doing the reviews. 
some KPIs, out of 100% of the orders, we identified 4.7 to be relevant. And as I said, only 1% to 2% come with a so-called positive MD from the supplier, saying, yes, something is contained. Combining these numbers means that less than 0.1% of all order items require a follow-up by the onboard crew. If we collect more and more, we generate a higher workload, which is not necessary because uh, then we would manage MDs for non-relevant items. With that, we avoid unnecessary MD requests and relieve the suppliers from an excessive workload. We also prevent conflicts between purchasers and suppliers and as anything needs to be documented, we avoid gaps and incompliances of the maintained IHM. And with that, we minimize the risk, damages, and also costs, also in case a ship is sold for further trading or for recycling. So with these basic principles, we can achieve a much higher compliance level compared to what others are doing. And they will look more into the quantity, but not into the quality aspect. Having said that, I would like to wrap up the webinar. So the conclusion in general is two thirds of all merchant ships need to have a maintained IHM and certified IHM on board. Penalties for all involved are very severe and the key factors for compliance and for efficient compliance is careful selection of purchase order items and individual support because many suppliers are not properly prepared or simply confused by the different approaches uh, which are present in the market still today. It's a new and complex task for the maritime industry. There are no approvals for service suppliers. A digital solution is a must have for IHM maintenance, also considering the period of time where this needs to be applied. And the service fee in general has a very marginal influence on the true costs. So comparing just service fees does not mean real consideration of what extra efforts are uh, caused on all the other uh, sites, including the clients, meaning the ship owners and managers, and then on top the suppliers efforts. Thank you very much until here, and I would like to hand back to Raina, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Henning and Liam, for your presentations. And uh, thanks all of you for submitting your questions. Mm -hmm. I also received a couple of questions in the private chat, so we can start with the Q&A session. First question um, to Henning. What if a supplier does not provide any MD or SDOC? Yeah, uh, fortunately it does not happen too often, which is good. But in case it does, first of all, we need to document it properly. We should not pretend to have any information at hand, which means uh, in the IHM maintenance report, this order item is listed. And then uh, we urge the ship owner to treat it as what we call for uh, initial item PCHM, potentially containing hazardous materials, because we can't prove otherwise. But we keep poking the uh, supplier and if nothing happens, we can still work on what we call an inspection-based material declaration. It's not 100% legal, but definitely it is better than not having anything at hand. Okay, thank you, Henning. Um, the next question will be in the direction of Liam. Uh, what data is transferred across? Yep, um, thank you very much for that, Raina. Um, really good question. So um, a couple of points on this in terms of um, the data that's transferred across. So um, the first one, obviously, um, is that the, the data is provided to us is fully remains um, in the control and owned by the ship owner or the ship manager that's providing that data. So that's really clear to be able to, to make um, a statement, first of all. 
Second point is that on the data that comes across, we're, we're only interested in the information that's required for IHM maintenance. So um, we're not interested in pricing, special offers, or discounts, for instance, within the purchase orders. It's specifically the data that's going to be used um, by the service supplier to be able to conduct IHM maintenance. So at a really high level, as an example, the, the, the data that we look to be able to receive are supplier details, so um, contact details, um, name, IMO number, um, vessel name, item description, and quantity, for example. Um, but again, yeah, those three points. One, the data remains um, the ownership of the, the ship ownership manager. Two, not special offer information that's required. And three, it's purely information for the management of IHM. Okay, thank you, Liam. Um, then we have a question here. Um, I see a problem to find and to detect relevant items for IHM. If you have 20,000 items per year from different suppliers, this makes the case is impossible. One case, if you order a, a thermometer according ISSA catalog in Europe or in Africa, one can be with mercury, one can be without. Yeah. Maybe Henning can uh, yes. answer that. Yes. I can fully understand this approach, but again, this touches the point where the uh, content, the potential presence of a hazardous material is put into the focus of the further action, which is not correct. First of all, we need to look at what is in the scope of the IHM. First of all, we have structure and equipment of the ship. And what, for instance, is excluded are loose items. So first question for this thermometer is, is it a fixed one? If yes, okay. Then we can say, is it a household-like appliance? Is it a thermometer which we can find in each and every heating system in a house? If we can't, then we have to request the MD and SDOC from the supplier. So that's the logic behind. We are not looking into it and whether or not it contains mercury. So then we ask for a statement. And if the supplier says, yes, it contains mercury, okay. Then we put this mercury containing item into the documentation. And once the ship via the Nautilus lock system, the engineer, for instance, or whoever is assigned to this job on board, gets a notification that with this order, you receive a thermometer, you have to label it. Once you install it, you have to tell via the system where you have installed it. And if you have installed one, two or five items or five of these thermometers, that's the process. We are not definitely not looking into what might be contained. And it's just about what item is to be considered in this regard. So, and with this in mind, the identification of relevant order items is much easier. And as I said, we really need to understand each and every exclusion. Thanks, Henning. Then we have uh, three questions in a row. Also, um, I'm sure that uh, you, Henning, will be able to answer them. Uh, the first one, do we collect SDOC and MD for all equipment in IHM scope or only those with hazmat positive entries? Yeah, I saw the question as like before. We don't know when it is, when such an item is ordered, whether or not it contains a hazardous material. This can only be, uh, this information can only be provided by the supplier. And this supplier very often has to ask his own supplier or the manufacturer what is contained and they should follow the same principles like what we have to implement here in IHM maintenance, which means the supplier can't react instantly. He needs maybe one, two weeks or sometimes even months to obtain the right information. So the scope of IHM maintenance is the core aspect and it requires a lot of detailed understanding and knowledge to really apply it efficiently. We are not considering what might be contained or not. That's, first of all, the, the key answer. 
So then the second one will follow. Does MD's collection start from the date of uh, the initial survey? Yeah, uh, that's basically, or it should be the latest date. In theory, once the IHM expert has conducted his shipboard inspection, has taken samples and he leaves the ship. After that, in theory, the IHM maintenance should be started. My experience so far is that anyone, it's the class uh, and port state control is happy to see when the IHM maintenance has been started with since the beginning of this year. But of course, if we have a gap, for instance, we, we have seen ships, they have uh, got their initial IHM done in the five, six, seven years ago. Of course, this gap is not acceptable. And if these cases occur, the only chance we have, because retroactive IHM maintenance is next to impossible, we can only suggest, okay, let's get an entirely new IHM done because the previous one has not been maintained at all. Okay, then finally, the third one here, does uh, IMO provide a common guidance for correct SDOC and MD? Yeah, I have to admit that the IGEM guidelines of IMO, the MEPC resolution 269.68, is not uh, very detailed in this regard. It just explains roughly what needs to be filled in where, and there's a lot of confusion around that still. I was working on the IHM guidelines and developed them on behalf of the German government back in 2005 and 2006 until they were finished. So there's also an ISO 30005 providing more guidance. But if you understand the process, if you understand the scope and the approach of IHM and IHM maintenance, it becomes very clear what needs to be filled in where. And we are providing this guidance as a manual to all suppliers we get in touch with on behalf of ship owners, for instance. Okay, yeah, thanks, Henning. And we have another question in the direction of Liam. Um, how much is it? So, so what does it cost? Yeah, this is um, always a Always a favorite question, and rightfully so. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the actual cost, this is um, very dependent on a few factors, one of which obviously is the amount of vessels that are involved. Um, what we do look to be able to do um, from an agile sort of point of view, and I hope I'm speaking on behalf of, of Henning as well, is look to be able to provide a, a bespoke or tailored fitted solution, um, and quote. So what I would say is, um, I think Henning's just moved it on to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, we have our contact details here, both for, for, for Henning at GSR and myself as well. Um, both of us would be more than happy to be able to look to put a, a bespoke or tailored fitted solution um, and quote price in place. So um, yet yeah, actually look forward to being able to, to have a conversation if you're interested in receiving that, that detailed information. Great, thanks, Liam. Uh, then, if this, we only have a few minutes left. One final question, I would say, also for Henning. You said that sampling was illegal for maintaining the IGEM. We've experienced that the class surveyor requested to have sampling done to verify statements issued by suppliers. What's your idea about this request? Um, it's a tricky one. It's really a good question because this is uh, highly depends on the approach, on how severe the issue is taken. It is in general a very severe issue, but there is nowhere written that the ship owner, for instance, has to verify whether or not the material declaration is correct. But for instance, in the EU ship recycling regulation, they talk about random sampling. Uh, it is by far not common practice and it's not a common approach. So if the class surveyor requires a sampling, he should exactly say which material of the product should be sampled and analyzed for which hazardous substance. And then I'm very sure that he stops talking about sampling very, very quickly. So it's a nice in theory and also, I need to admit, I'm not taking the content of material declarations for granted. 
Uh, and what we also do, we are not only categorizing the order items into relevant, non-relevant. GSR has done more than 600 IHMs. And we have a lot of experience what might be contained in certain products. What we do on top of this categorization of relevant, non-relevant is we say, okay, this is a critical material, a critical product where we have found very often hazardous substances in there, including asbestos, which is banned. And for safeguarding our clients, we have created the third category, which is called additional. And for these high risk items, which would normally be excluded from the scope of IHM maintenance, we still require the material declaration and supplies declaration of conformity. Nevertheless, in other industries, they do the random sampling or a targeted sampling depending on the risk categorization, which needs to be developed here, or which has been developed, but not implemented. Uh, but I would think that this applies far more to shipyards, new building yards, repair and conversion yards, but not to the owner himself. I think this is absolutely overdone. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for taking your time and attending this webinar. Um, yes, in case of any further questions or uh, individual requests, please feel free to contact us at any time. Thanks again and have a nice rest of the day. Yeah. Thank you also from my side. It was great seeing that you have all participated and very good questions. As Raina said, you're more than welcome to get in touch with us anytime. And I hope you found the webinar interesting. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, and indeed from my side, and now to this log, um, again, just to reflect what Henning said, some really interesting questions. Um, hopefully you found the webinar um, useful and look forward to um, speaking with all of you hopefully soon. But in the meantime, wish you a, a good evening. Thanks all.